Central banks, through trial and error, have discovered that keeping price hikes to around 2% is tolerable for voters. However, when inflation surges beyond what's accepted, reaching 5% or more, voters grow agitated, sparking concerns from Congress and signaling a red flag for the central banks. The recent unprecedented events, particularly during the COVID-19 lockdowns, witnessed an excessive injection of money supply, threatening severe inflation. This led to drastic rate hikes by the Federal Reserve, which, while temporarily lowering inflation, brought about financial sector distress. In this conversation, Preston Pish and Dr. Peter St. Ange discuss the current economic climate the world finds itself in now, and why sometimes Bitcoin is so hard to explain to people. The trick in central banking is, it's like being a gasoline feed. Okay, the trick in that gig is don't take too much at once, right? If you're ripping off all the neighbors, it's okay if you take a little half gallon a night from everybody. But for goodness sakes, do not drain one guy's tank all at once. He's going to notice that and then the gig's up. So central banks try to keep price hikes to a, a minimum. In practice, about 2% is what they have kind of through trial and error discovered that voters are willing to put up with. And so that means that they typically print something like 6% of the money supply. Essentially, four of that is soaked up in population growth or economic growth, and the, the remaining 2% bleeds over into higher prices. And that they don't fear because they have these paid PhDs who sort of lecture the public how, you know, this is just part of free market capitalism and, you know, this is the price of progress and is that everything's going to get a little bit more expensive every year. So where they really get scared is when inflation gets away from them and gets up into five, seven, nine percent because they know that at that point, voters get angry, if voters get angry, Congress gets angry, and then Congress can put a leash on them. So why did it get out of hand this time? And the core, sort of the original sin here was in order to buy the COVID lockdowns, it was fantastically expensive. This is really everywhere in the world that went through lockdowns, they had to absolutely pump out money in order to bribe voters into doing it. So in the case of the US, it took about six, six to seven trillion dollars is how much they increased the money supply during COVID. So it went from about 15 trillion to about 21, 22. Now, if you print that much money all at once, every school of economics, even Paul Krugman, even the Marxists, they all know that it's going to lead to extreme inflation. So to first approximation, that's going to give you something like 40% inflation. It's not going to happen all at once, but it's going to come over time. Now, if we sort of pause the story there for a moment, once inflation started taking off, the Fed really had two options. One option would have been that it tell it, you know, it, it identifies the source of the inflation, which was obscene levels of government spending, and then it tells the government, you guys got to cut back, you got to lower the spending, you got to get rid of the deficit. In fact, Powell could have forced them to do that if he simply said, I'm not going to buy government bonds anymore. He could have actually forced the feds to end the deficits. But that's a politically costly thing to do to the people who run the organization, right? The, the Fed exists at Congress's pleasure and they can always change the rules on that. So instead of doing that, he said, OK, the feds are spending. I'm not going to complain about that. That's probably going to continue. And so what are my other options if I want to I want to reduce the amount of spending in the economy, right? I want to reduce the amount of money that's out there chasing goods. Then the only man left standing is to crush the private sector. And the way they do that is by hiking interest rates. So up they went. The fastest rise in about 50 years or so. It was really an epic level of rate hikes. And then, you know, of course, a lot of us warned that if you do it that quick, uh, you're going to break something, specifically uh, something in the financial sector, which is very top heavy. So it's very vulnerable. And of course, that's what happened in March when the banks started going under. They responded by pushing out, I call them pre bailouts, but they basically pushed out trillions of guarantees and open windows. And so where we stand at the moment is that for the past year or so, inflation has been coming down it has largely been coming down because of energy prices. Usually energy falls whenever the world economy is slowing, and that's now happening really coordinated across the world. So even China is slowing. Uh, and then the other reason is that the world sort of routed around Mr. Putin's war. That was bringing down headline inflation. And so, you know, the administration was declaring victory. The Fed was not because the Fed could see the underlying numbers, which is the core inflation. 
that's excluding food and energy. That's really the number that the Fed sort of grades itself on. And core inflation has been stuck really for about a year. Uh, mm -hmm. If we compare to the absolute worst of the inflation last year or two years ago, core has only come down about half point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's really pretty stuck. So the Fed is still concerned. That's why, you know, they've been sort of pouring cold water and saying that it'll be some time before rates come back down. And then just in the past two months now, so if we want to get the latest stories for what's going on in inflation, in the past two months now, inflation has started to rise again, largely because energy prices are starting to go up again. And so if that continues, then the Fed is going to be a lot more concerned. It's going to get people upset about, they're already upset about their grocery bills, but that'll get them upset about uh, the gas pump again. Uh, and then, you know, that leads to congressional pressure. So the Fed is, is kind of back to the corner at this point. They won't say no to the government. They've, they're sort of stuck with these high rates and they're just basically waiting for the economy to die so that that'll cut down inflation. And, you know, if sufficient millions of jobs are lost at that point, they can declare victory and then they can go back to start to normalize, you know, not until that happens, are we going to see these sort of financial stresses and the bank crises stop? I think it's important for people to kind of wrap their head around just fractional reserve banking in general. So like when we get these deflationary right. fits, it's a function of what we're calling money, which is everything's just right. debt and every, everything is just somebody else's IOU. And because of that, right. there's counterparty risk with every single piece of currency that people are sitting on that we call money mm -hmm. and those explode. But if we actually have money, that's a bare asset, meaning I give you right. a unit, Peter, and then you give me that, that unit back, or you give me two units, me having that, like that can't become deflationary. It's a bare asset. It's, it's a, it's a monetary baseline unit in, in the currency, right? right? Which is, and, and that's what Bitcoin represents is right. if I have Bitcoin and I give it to you, you are now the, the, the owner of that unit. That is monetary baseline money. It can't be deflationary. It can't go poof and disappear. It's in, so it's been so abstracted away from everybody. I mean, you go out and you ask a hundred people off the street there. And I, if, if I would say that to them, they'd be like, I have no idea what this alien's talking about. Like, what is he, what is he saying? Yeah. What are those words that he's talking about? It, it gets As, and, frustrating yeah. because there's so much that's been ab abstracted away from with the terminology itself. And, you know, sometimes in Bitcoin, we talk about how, or, you know, we sort of complain how difficult it is to explain Bitcoin to people. And the thing is, if you really sit back for a second and consider how difficult fiat is to explain, right? <laughs> yes. There was this, you know, <laughs> you're like, what is it? Uh, it's uh, debt. And uh, I, I mean, what? Right. Uh, there was this professor in Switzerland who, as an experiment, is a PhD, is a monetary expert. He's, he's, he's widely known. I can't remember the guy's name. I want to say Warner. Anyway, he went out and asked a bank. He said, okay. I want you to make a loan for me. And, and I mean, I'm just going to repay it the next day. But I want you to go through step by step exactly how that loan was created. Because apparently, PhD monetary economists, they have not figured out whether banks, commercial banks, print the money they lend you. Okay? Mm -hmm. So like, and, 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 and what he concluded is that when you go to the bank, so you, you have to have an account at a bank in order to get a mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. Like you would think, well, you know, I want to get a mortgage at your bank. Why can't I just pay you fees? And then you send me the mortgage to, you know, my account somewhere else. No, no, you always have to have an account at that bank. And the reason is because when you go in for a loan, they literally create the money on the spot. Mm -hmm. So that's very hard for people to grasp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, when we compare and, and notably, that was a monetary expert, PhD, he'd been doing money his entire life. He's all over the place doing interviews on money. And he had to go through that with the bank to sit down and figure out exactly how it's created. So when people talk about Bitcoin's complexity, <laughs> you know, look at fiat. Now, the good news for the perspective of Bitcoin is that, you know, if you take the complexity of fiat, the complexity of central banking, uh, fraction reserve banking, the relationships they have with the money printers. So you have kind of the mother ship, you know, printer over at the Fed, and then you have the little baby franchise printers. And all right, we just try to go through all that. And then you get to the credit card and, you know, where does the credit card money come from? <laughs> you know, who, how is that born? And, you know, every time a child laughs, a new credit card balance. Support. 
So when you actually try to go through all those things, it is very difficult to understand. And you compare that to Bitcoin where you own it, right? I mean, Bitcoin is literally like the way that your grandmother thinks money works, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is that you got a coin and that's a piece of money. And if the bank puts a dollar on your you know, passbook, that's because they got a coin in the vault. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's literally how your grandmother thinks money works. And that is literally how Bitcoin works. Mm -hmm. So in a way, our job is extraordinarily easy. The only reason why people are able to use fiat, despite how ridiculously difficult it is to understand, is because everybody else does it. Okay, mm -hmm. so everybody else uses credit cards. And I can see how it works. You buy stuff, you don't have to pay for it. When you're like 70 years old, that's, that's kind of amazing. You're like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. Okay, so you buy stuff, you don't have to pay for it. And then in the mail, they're going to ask you to pay something else. And that's going to be pretty much the same deal. A little bit of fees. Okay, good. That's all people need because they can see that other people do it. They don't get eaten by lions. Okay, that, that process works. And so it's ultimately going to be the same in Bitcoin where normal people are using Bitcoin. Frankly, they're not going to need to understand it. It is much, much easier to understand than fiat, but they're not going to care. Their question is, are other people using it? You know, are they using Lightning or whatever other payment technology comes along? I hope there will be more. They're using Lightning. They're paying almost nothing. You know, three SaaS per transaction, whatever the number is. Good, it works. That's really all I need to know. Reflecting on the complex dynamics of fiat, central banking, and the intricacies of the monetary system, contrasted with the straightforward principles of Bitcoin, one can appreciate the simplicity of this decentralized monetary system. The prevailing ease of using fiat comes from observing everyone else doing the same, yet Bitcoin, despite being simpler to grasp, requires acceptance and usage to prevail. Ultimately, the adoption and widespread use of Bitcoin's technology will stem from its success at holding value over the long term and in everyday transactions, driving its utility and ease of use beyond the complexities of traditional financial systems. Before we exit this video, we want to connect this channel with our audience. What's your favorite article, book, or podcast that energized you on the topic of Bitcoin? Comment below if you'd like us to break it down into a film like this. If you're looking to watch another, try this one here. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more.